Hello, and welcome back to the short course. My name is Jacob Worth. Uh, I'm a current postdoc in the Sigma group. I'll be walking you through module four, which is modeling and analysis. In this module, we'll be talking about the multivariate linear regression analysis we typically employ in our workflow and thinking about how to extrapolate into new uh, chemical space, as well as uh, understanding ways to um, gain mechanistic insight from our models. Just an overview of module four. Um, we'll have a quick introduction into the modeling process and talk about a few examples where we've used the workflow in the past. And then we'll move on to linear regression and validation and we'll talk about how these models are produced and how we use statistical validation methods to compare and rank them. And then in a separate video, module 4.1, I'll discuss how we use optimal, mo optimal models to predict new reaction components, as well as to start to interpret different parameters in the models to kind of gain that mechanistic insight we're interested in. Really the overall goal of this module is to use the data science tools available to us to produce robust models for further applications we're interested in. So looking back, we've been largely in the asymmetric catalysis space um, using delta delta G uh, double dagger as our output uh, and largely looking at an NCO selectivity, whether it be in trans transition metal catalysis or organic catalysis, um, we've been um, uh, successful in featureizing these different ligands and catalysts. We've also been able to explore uh, more non-traditional areas, such as the development of flow battery catholytes, which we actually use solubility as an output in our modeling procedure. And then finally looking at poly polymerization reactions where we look at different site selectivity, uh, so site selectivities of those reactions. So now that we've made it to module four, you sh should have your initial parameter set and featureization of reaction components complete. So you're ready to start modeling. Um, just kind of like to stress that this is, uh, the modeling process is a really iterative workflow. Um, more often than not, when we start modeling, we realize we have to kind of go back and refine some parameter sets or you know, explore more chemical space. Um, and the modeling can really help guide you there. It can kind of show you where you're not effectively describing certain reaction components or certain catalysts. Uh, it can kind of maybe, so I'll help you guide you, help guide you into where you maybe need to focus more attention to. In general, we use two different types of software for our modeling procedure, uh, either MATLAB or uh, Python scripts, which are generated in-house. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the specific details of these uh, two softwares, but these are the common ones we, we use. So we often start with a univariate analysis, uh, which is really the initial evaluation of our parameter set um, to get an idea of how the parameters are related to one another, how correlated they are to one another, and how they correlate to our output, which in this case is delta, delta G. And then we move on to the MLR workflow, which is the multivariate linear regression workflow. Uh, this is when we start to look at more complex models and how different parameters uh, uh, correlate to one another. A few questions and a few things we'll cover over the next uh, module and a few slides will be how many parameters are really appropriate? Um, I think this often comes up sometimes. Uh, next, looking at should I have interaction or cross, cross terms in my model and how to does this affect me you know, downstream and what are the consequences of that? And then finally thinking about why it's important to normalize our parameters. Um, and lastly, um, why it's important to uh, avoid collinear parameters in our models. So looking first at the preliminary, preliminary cor correlation, the univariate analysis, we can produce this correlation matrix of our parameter set using the software I outlined in the last slide. And it really gives us a first sense of how these parameters relate to one another, how collinear they are, how they relate to our output as univariate uh, correlation. We just try to gain any useful insight we can. So for example, does an NBO value correlate really strongly with the measure delta delta G, which would be great. Um, or does it provide more of a classification, in this case, more of a zero or one, um, which is also good to know uh, just in general how it treats the data relative to the parameter. So one case study that I'll, I will be referencing throughout this module in the next video uh, is this study we published recently about bifunctional hydrogen bond donor catalysis, specifically the enantioselective addition to nitroalkenes. Um, so for example, of a univariate analysis, looking at the nucleophile, we see the MBO value of X um, in comparison to the measure delta delta G is really just providing a classification of nucleophile, which in this case is carbon versus heteroatoms such as phosphor phosphorus and sulfur. So although it's not a really strong direct correlation, it gives us a sense of how that's operating in our model. Secondly, we can look at these polarizability and l sterimal terms for nitroalkenes. And we see they have a really high collinear score of almost 0 
So they're effectively describing the same feature. So we really want to avoid having these two parameters in the same model. Next, looking at our multivariate linear regression workflow, we can start with this forward stopwise regression, which is the algorithm that is used to start to build models. And what is used is the p-value of each parameter, how we uh, judge its statistical significance when it's adding more parameters to the um, model. So this is kind of how you get the idea of how many parameters are added to each model um, and how many are needed for a good correlation if one can, 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 can uh, exist. Next, looking at statistical metrics, uh, R squared, uh, the goodness of fit, uh, the LLO, the leave one out, which is a, a, a cross-validation method, and then K-fold and external validation. These are just um, different statistical metri metrics we will cover in the next few slides and ones we use to um, compare models and really judge the robustness of our model. And then finally, we can sort these different models from the, the forward stepwise regression step. Um, and the great thing about this is it can remove models that have those uh, high collinearity terms, the parameters, and furthermore, it can rank based on stats, so you can start to compare them based on statistical scores. The good thing about our modeling process is that we normalize the parameters, which allows for direct comparison of all the parameters. So now you can compare the different coefficients and how, one, how heavily one contributes relative to another. We can also look at the signs of them to see if there's a positive or negative trend uh, relative to the delta delta G, which can be helpful in understanding um, how it uh, kind of correlates to um, different uh, kind of mechanistic uh, features. And finally, I just say to stress again, this is an iterative process, so we often have to go back, refine data sets, explore more chemical space, um, and potentially develop new parameters or uh, grab different parameters. And once we have a hap uh, a model we're happy with, we can move on into this mechanistic interpretation and then the different applications we're interested in. So looking back uh, at our thyurea um, bifunctional hydrogen bond donor uh, catalysis case study, starting with the 150 reaction data set, we can look at two models that are produced from a forward stepwise scan. And one thing I'll note is the visualization is, is key in distinguishing models, especially when you have a large pool of model candidates with a lot of um, similar statistics. It helps a lot to uh, visualize the different models and how they look and differ from one another. So these two, uh, you can see, have pretty similar statistics. Um, however, they look quite different. So a few things we look at when looking at these models is overfitting and underfitting. So in the overfitting case, we see that these three points have the same measured value, but the predicted value is actually different for all three of them. This would be called an overfit. Alternatively, if we look at underfitting, we see the measured value uh, of these points uh, varies quite a bit across the board, but the predicted value is the same for all of them. So we're actually underfitting the data in this case. Although it's not too prominent in these models, we often like to look for these, and it can get much worse in other data sets depending on um, uh, the different parameters you use and the different data sets you use. Um, but in this case, it's not uh, too bad. Another thing we look for in the, uh, visualizing models is kind of clustering. So you'll notice here that this is a quite clustered model, kind of broken into four main clusters. Where this one, although it has uh, well, at least one kind of large cluster, it is much more well distributed. So these are kind of some things to keep in mind when uh, comparing uh, one model from another. And then lastly on this side, you'll see that we have an interaction or cross term here. So like I mentioned before, this could have some consequences uh, further uh, downstream in the workflow uh, when it comes to like mechanistic interpretation. And we'll get to that uh, later in the module. So now that we've kind of fast forwarded, we did the forward stepwise scan, we can uh, now get to our optimal model, which um, I've shown here. Um, it has an eight parameter model, which uh, contains four catalyst parameters, two nucleophile parameters, one electrophile parameter, and one solvent parameter uh, um, accounting for solvent effects. So you'll see we have the different kind of validation uh, methods here, which we'll go through next. So first starting with predict R squared. This was done using a pseudo random partition of our data set, our 150 reactions into 50-50 split of training set and validation set. So what happens is our software takes uh, a random 50% um, reactions out, and then the remaining 50% is used as a training set, and then we get a validation uh, set that we use to um, kind of judge the initial predictive nature of our uh, model. And we see here the predict our squared value is 0.81, which is pretty good relative to our model fit of 0.82. Next, we can look at LORO, which is leave one reaction out. Uh, it was recently developed uh, 
for these kind of data mining projects that are comprised of multiple publications to build a large data set. So how this works is one publication is removed from the full data set um, and held as a validation set. The model is retrained on the remaining data and then we get the uh, predict R squared value for that validation set. And this is done for every publication in the data set. So you get a LOR average score. So for in this case, we have a 0.72 average score of that, which is a pretty good score uh, indicating that the data set and the model are not the model is not biased towards one or dependent towards one specific publication, which is uh, what we'd like to see. Next, we can look at K-fold, which is a cross-validation method. Um, it is a random data, data set split into a number of groups, which is K, and then the training set is comprised of K minus one. So in this case, we have a five-fold uh, K-fold cross-validation method. So we, have, we split the data set into five folds. We have, so in this K minus one, we'll have four folds that are uses the training set and then the validation set is the remaining fold. And then this is, since this is a random data set split, we like to take an average of these um, typically four or five times to make sure we are getting a full representation of the data set and it's um, a full uh, representation of the different splits that are possible. In this case, we have a 0.75 score, which is considered a good score relative to our fits and our different um, uh, other validation methods. And then finally, the LOO, which is leave one out, which is also uh, sometimes referred to as Q squared. In this uh, validation method, one data point is held out of the data set as a validation and repeated for every data point to produce the Q squared. So in this one, one data point is removed and then predicted, and it's just repeated over and over again for every data point that is in the data set. And then the resulting uh, uh, R squared is called Q squared, and that would be your validation score. For, so for this one, we have an LOO of 0.76, which relative to our model fit is a pretty good score. And we, what we like to see typically in our modeling process is we like to see an LOO that is not too far away from our R squared. And we also like to see a, a K fold, which is not too far away from our LOO. And this means that we have a pretty robust model and it's, um, uh, alluding to the fact that it has some predictive capability potentially, um, which we can, which, which, we, which we will explore later. So additional notes on these uh, statistic, statistical validation methods. Um, k is really helpful in detecting overfitting, which is the case we have too many parameters uh, in the model development stage. And this really occurs when you do the average fivefold and you start seeing some funky numbers show up, such as 0.2, or they like, starts um, the range is really high. Sometimes you can get some negative numbers, which really you're essentially breaking the model, um, which um, typically means you have too many parameters or your model's uh, incapable of predicting uh, validation points pulled out of your full data set. And the LOO, it typically uses our initial validation method for predictive, uh, predictive, abil predictive ability, as well as use extensively in our model development, especially in um, ranking and comparing models. So that along with the R squared are kind of the two top statistical metrics we use in uh, initially kind of picking good versus bad models. And then we, from there, can go on to visualize models we, that have good statistics uh, associated with them. A few other notes, uh, validation methods employed are typically dependent on the data set size. So in this case, we have a fairly large uh, data set size of 150 reactions. Um, so a 50-50 training set validation set may be uh, appropriate for this, but if you have a smaller data set, it, it, it's probably more appropriate to use maybe a 70-30 split or even a smaller split as you'll need, as you have lower points, you'll need more of the data to represent the training set and uh, uh, properly um, uh, incorporate into the model. Especially the LORO, which is kind of specific for data mining projects which is appropriate here, but for um, normal, you know, single reaction uh, uh, modeling processes, um, it, would, it wouldn't be relevant to use. And then finally, the kind of all these together are useful detecting bias towards specific data in the training set. So pulling different uh, data and seeing how the validation scores kind of differ, it, it can really give you a sense if your data is kind of uh, dependent on a few points or if it's kind of biased towards uh, one specific kind of reaction type. Um, so all these kind of in combination can be helpful in determining that bias that may be present. So that's the end of module 4.0. Um, next in 4.1, we'll talk about how to use an optimal model to predict new reaction components, new reaction types, and how to kind of start to um, deconstruct models and look at the different parameters, hopefully gain some mechanistic insight. 
So I can't wait to see you and hope you join us in the next video. Thanks.